Gandhi seriously. Gandhi and what he said. And he said repeatedly that anyone could do what he did. Anyone. What he meant was that all he did was live according to a truthful process available to anyone on earth. And if anyone else he felt were to follow the process Gandhi did, she or he would accomplish the same kinds of things that he did. From the standpoint that he worked overthrowing the British Empire by mobilizing the Indian people in a nonviolent revolution was, after all, nothing special from the standpoint of the force behind the creation of every star in the universe. Earth-shaking events were only a little smaller than Earth itself from the standpoint of the infinite power of truth. So all Gandhi ever did was to experiment step by step with truth, and anyone on earth can do that. What he meant by an experiment with truth was to go totally for the truth as one understands it at each stage of, stage of your life without set expectations. Without set expectations. Then act on it by seeking and acting on the truth, Gandhi discovered the power of nonviolence, which he then acted on for the rest of his life. He described nonviolence in terms of means and ends. The means can be likened to a seed and the end to a tree. And there is just the same inviolable connection between the means and the end, as there is between the seed and the tree, we reap exactly as we sow. As the philosopher Jacques Maritain put it, the means is the end in the process of becoming. The means is the end in the process of becoming. In the 1960s, the contemplative Thomas Merton felt that Cold War policies were pushing the United States and the Soviet Union into a total nuclear war that would destroy humankind. The monk was writing and praying for a miraculous change in humanity avert nuclear war. He wrote to a friend, really we have to pray for a total and profound change in the mentality of the whole world. The critical need was for humanity's complete change of heart and totally new outlook on the world. Otherwise, he thought a nuclear holocaust would occur. Thomas Merton initially thought that President John F. Kennedy was, in this context, unequal to the challenge. In a letter to his friend, a man named W.H. Ferry, he evaluated Kennedy's character in a critical way. <coughs> he said, I have little confidence in Kennedy. I think he cannot fully measure up to the magnitude of his task and lacks creative imagination and the deeper kind of sensitivity that is needed. Too much the time and life mentality than which I can imagine nothing further in reality from, say, Lincoln. What is needed is really not shrewdness or craft, but what the politicians don't have. Depth, humanity, and a certain totality of self-forgetfulness and compassion. 
not just for individuals, but for humanity as a whole, a deeper kind of dedication. Maybe Kennedy will break through into that someday by a miracle, but such people are before long marked out for assassination. If Kennedy chose to emulate the courage of Lincoln in trying to make a turn for justice and peace, he would, like that predecessor, be assassinated. If by miracle a Cold War president should become a peacemaker with the communists, he would end up on a cross. That was a given for someone like Merck understood the context and the consequences. It would be the consequence of trying to turn around what the government and the people had become to their peril in the Cold War. For the sake of human survival, one had to pray, as Merton did, for the president's transformation. Such a shuva, such a metanoia, such a repentance in President Kennedy would result in a twofold outcome. Prophetic steps toward peace and a prophet's reward. It was a, a Good Friday kind of prayer. Praying for JFK to become what humanity needed him to be in the context of the Cold War, the push toward nuclear war, meant, in effect, sending him to Dallas. Kennedy never met Gandhi, and he, well, of course, Gandhi died 12 years before JFK took office, and Gandhi never visited the United States. And he never met Merton, who lived seclusion of his monastery in the hills of Kentucky. But perhaps the closest the president came to an encounter with Gandhi and Merton was a, a dialogue he had with six Gandhian Quakers in the Oval Office. It took place on May the 1st, 1962. It's a little known meeting and it shines a light on why JFK was assassinated. The Quakers had been standing outside the White House. They were picketing there. They were in peace vigil with 1,000 other members of the Society of Friends. And then these six representatives, delegation of six, came inside. And they sat alone with the president, just the seven people together in a circle with the president in his rocking chair who sat listening to them intently. These six Quakers were asking President Kennedy to change the government's direction, as they put it, from headlong preparation for nuclear war <coughs> to a total foreign policy geared to the peace race. That was a term Kennedy himself had used in his address to the United Nations the year before. So as to achieve, as the Quakers put it, a speedy transition to general and complete disarmament. So it was a request for a deal of Gandhi and Merton. What was John F. Kennedy doing meeting with a group of radical peacemakers committed to general and complete disarmament. Well, the friends, the Quakers, were in fact drawing on his own vision and language. In his UN speech the previous fall, challenging the Soviet Union to a peace race, JFK had said the U.S. and USSR needed to advance together step by step, stage by stage, until general and complete disarmament has actually been achieved.
Quaker Representative Dorothy Hutchinson, a leader of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, told Kennedy in this little meeting, we're here, Mr. President, to suggest a completely different orientation in foreign policy, a whole series of initiatives for peace. The U.S. could, for example, halt nuclear testing. Hutchinson was challenging the President on his resumption of nuclear testing in the Pacific, which had happened only one week before that. Kennedy said he agreed with the idea of taking such initiatives for peace, but he observed that there were obstacles at home. He said, all virtue does not reside on our side. It was a heretical anti-Cold War statement that he would develop the following year in his American University Address, where he would insist that it wasn't just the Russians who were to blame for the nuclear threat on Earth. First of all, he would say, for there to be any hope at all for peace, Americans had to examine their own attitudes. As he spoke with to the Quakers of his having already taken a few admittedly small steps for peace. This is, uh, remember, May 1, 1962. It's just a, a year and three, four, five, five months, four to five months into his presidency. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis hasn't occurred yet. That will be the following fall. So as he's describing these few steps he may have taken for peace, his visitors broke in to suggest something bolder. They wanted him to help with food for China. The U.S. should offer, they said, its surplus food to the People's Republic of China, then considered an enemy but whose people were in famine. Kennedy said, do you mean you would feed your enemy when he has his hands on your throat? The Quaker said, they meant exactly that. Sam Levery, the chair of the Friends Committee on National Legislation, said, as Quaker Christians, we know that Jesus said, if your enemy hungers, feed him. As a Catholic, we know that. Kennedy said, I do know that. I propose making food available immediately if it were politically possible. But the China lobby is strong. There's no point in my marching up Capitol Hill to defeat like President Wilson did. The friends pressed the president on disarmament. They said he was appointing people to his arms control and disarmament agency who lacked any past commitment to disarmament. He had even appointed a Republican as his director. Kennedy explained his reasoning. He said, if skeptical people on the board became convinced of disarmament, he had a better chance in Congress than if the board was made up of people known to have had long-time convictions for disarmament. Then he looked around at the friends and he said with a smile, you believe in redemption, don't you? <laughs> he added, the Pentagon opposes every proposal for disarmament. David Barso, the age of 22, the youngest Quaker in the group, said later that the essence of what Kennedy told them was, the military industrial complex is very strong. If you folks are serious about trying to get our government to take these kinds of steps, you've got to get much more organized to put pressure on the government to move in this direction. The members of the Quaker delegation agreed afterward that John Kennedy seemed to feel more boxed in by adversaries at home than he did by enemies abroad. Henry Cadbury, the group's elder, who was a distinguished theologian, saw the president as frustrated and trapped, especially by the power of the Pentagon. Yet the plain-speaking Quakers, who challenged the president in unique ways to go much farther than he had, paradoxically made JFK feel less alone when his secretary, Kenny O'Donnell, came in to point out that his next appointment was waiting. Kennedy replied, let them wait. I'm learning things from these Quakers. So after keeping the friends another five minutes as they were leaving, he mentioned to Henry Cadbury 
that he had known of him as a beloved professor at the Harvard Divinity School when JFK was an undergraduate. The president said, I never spent much time at the Divinity School. Now it's maybe be regrettable that I didn't. The Quakers, on the basis of beliefs and scriptures they held in common with Kennedy, had sympathetically yet truthfully pushed the president for bold initiatives for peace, such as halting nuclear testing and sharing food with China. They had also encouraged him toward the seemingly impossible yet necessary goal in a nuclear age of general and complete disarmament. Forty years after this meeting took place, I interviewed the three surviving Quakers who had met with President Kennedy. What has struck them all as amazing was that Kennedy listened to them. David Hartsoe said, he didn't just let you say something for a minute and then go on to the next agenda item. His humanity really impressed me. Here is the President of the United States sitting in his rocking chair listening to this bunch of Quakers and he was listening at least as much as he was talking. I said to David that I thought that explained why JFK was killed. He not only listened to the Quakers, he did what they said. He was carrying out their, and in fact his, program of peace initiatives toward general and complete disarmament. The Quakers were simply asking the president that he be serious about what he had already said, not privately, but to the whole world in his address to the United Nations. It turned out that JFK was serious, or that he became much more serious. I talked with Marcus Raskin, a former assistant to George Bundy, who was Kennedy's national security advisor. Raskin had resigned from the Kennedy administration to become its critic. However, he said he saw the president change after the Cuban Missile Crisis. In Ruskin's view, Kennedy had experienced a kind of enlightenment through the Missile Crisis. Reflecting on JFK's change years later, Raskin said, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, it became clear to him that there had to be there had to be a way out of the arms race. He really was frightened, truly frightened of it in ways he understood before, but not in an existential way. I would argue, he said, that it was at that moment when very serious discussions began going on internally within the administration. Raskin told me to check out JFK's orders to his government in a document known as NSAM 239, National Security Action Memorandum 239. I went up to the JFK Library in Massachusetts and found it there. It's online now, it's beautiful. One year after JFK met with the Quakers, and half a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he issued this National Security Action Memorandum number 239. It ordered his principal national security advisors pursue both a nuclear test ban and a policy of general and complete disarmament. Marcus Raskin commented on the meaning of this document. He said, the president said, look, we've really got to figure out how to get out of this arms race. This is just impossible. Give me a plan, the first stage of the police of how we're going to get out of it. So this would be a 30% cut of arms, then move from that stage to the next stage. He was into that. There is no question about it. JFK was serious. He pushed hard for nuclear test ban. In his June 1963 American University address, he said that he and British Prime Minister Macmillan and Chairman Khrushchev would be holding discussions in Moscow on a test ban treaty. In Moscow. Why not Washington? He couldn't do it in Washington. The 
In the meantime, he said in this American University address, he was suspending U.S. tests. That's a unilateral suspension with the explicit hope that it would foster trust with the enemy. The president was taking a unilateral peace initiative to promote trust that had been recommended to him by the Quakers. In an astonishing six weeks, Kennedy succeeded in negotiating a test ban treaty with Khrushchev. He negotiated it himself. Anytime that Gabriel Harriman in Moscow, who was his representative there, had any question about the test ban, he went back to a telephone and he called Kennedy and they worked it out and then they went through. Kennedy had done an end run throughout his military advisors who were strongly opposed to the agreement. Khrushchev had responded to his peace initiative with enthusiasm and agreement on the test ban. But then came the U.S. Senate, which had to approve it. JFK said it would be a miracle if the heavily opposed Senate were to ratify it. He called together a citizens group in the White House, scientists, women's magazine editors, labor and church leaders, who then took on a national campaign to change the public opposition to a test ban. JFK appealed to the country for support. He went on TV. Public opinion turned around. The Senate passed the treaty in September by an overwhelming margin, 80 to 19. JFK was so serious about his goal of general and complete disarmament that he made it law. That's NSAM 239. And in that document, the test ban was not even JFK's primary concern. That was general and complete disarmament, which he emphasized four times in the document's three paragraphs. In his American University address, the following month he reiterated, our primary long-range interest is general and complete disarmament, designed to take place by stages, permitting parallel political developments to build the new institutions of peace which would take the place of ours. He was serious. He was ordering his government to pursue a goal whose nonviolent process had transformed his own attitudes. The means is the end in the process of becoming. By the very process of his concrete peace initiatives, he was becoming a peacemaking president when they transformed him. By the fall of 1963, in the eyes of John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, the Cold War was in effect over. The means of dialogue and peacemaking they were following had transformed their previous ideological goals into the end of world peace. JFK was also serious in initiating what today is perhaps the least known of all his many little known steps toward peace. That was to be his response a year and a half later to the Quakers' bold suggestion that the United States <coughs> offered surplus food to the famished Chinese people. The president never did do that. However, in the fall of 1963, when the Soviet Union experienced a severe grain shortage, Kennedy decided to sell wheat to the Russians. Taking a lead from the Quakers' book, <coughs> which was his book as well, he chose to help feed the same Cold War enemies whom the year before he had struggled with on the brink of nuclear war. Others in the government said in effect to him the same thing he had said to the Quakers, when you feed an enemy who has his hands on your throat. Vice President Lyndon Johnson said to Kennedy O'Donnell, selling this wheat to the Russians would be the worst political mistake he ever made. The members of Kennedy's political staff, led by O'Donnell, were dead set against the grain sale 
to Russia. Nevertheless, Kennedy went ahead with the wheat sale, so the enemy. Today, it's almost forgotten. You won't find it in almost any biography of Kennedy. But at the time, neither the decision nor the process was easy. He was now moving to a different drummer, marching to a different drummer than his military advisors were. <clears throat> he chose the wheat sale as still another initiative for peace, following the spirit of the six Quakers' recommendation. It was not only the right thing to do, as proclaimed in the ancient scriptures that he and they held in common, it was also another way to mark an end to the Cold War. JFK had reached a, key, a place, a point in his presidency, where there was even a beginning of a popular groundswell to support his initiatives for peace. In that hopeful fall of 1963, it was not only President John F. Kennedy who was turning toward peace, the people were beginning to turn with him. But that turn would not be completed. So, <clears throat> why was JFK assassinated by what Thomas Burton called the unspeakable, a kind of systemic evil? It goes beyond the words. It is so... It's so much a place where we don't want to go. And which we can identify today in political terms as involving his own national security state. And why was he willing to risk his life at peace? Why was he willing to take up and carry out the peace initiatives recommended by the six friends, thus placing himself in mortal danger? What was it that happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis that capitalized JFK's extraordinary turn toward peace? What was it that made him that much more serious? <coughs> In the Missile Crisis, President Kennedy had to confront the unspeakable in the form of total nuclear war, what Burton was fearing from his prayers in the Abbey of Gethsemane. In the Missile Crisis, President Kennedy was at the height of a terrifying conflict that his own anti-Castro policies had helped precip precipitate. And he felt the situation spiraling out of control, especially because of pressures and provocations by the Pentagon led by General Curtis LeMay. At a moment when the world was falling into darkness, Kennedy did what his generals thought was unforgivable. <clears throat> he not only rejected their pressures for attacking Cuba and the Soviet Union, even worse, the President reached out to the enemy for help. That could be considered treason. Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev saw it as hope. Robert Kennedy had met secretly with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin in Washington, warning that the President was losing control of his generals and needed the Soviets' help. When Khrushchev received Kennedy's plea for help in Moscow, he turned to his foreign minister, Andrei Gromyko, and he said, we have to let Kennedy know that we want to help him. Khrushchev hesitated when he heard himself say help. Just when the U.S. president seemed to be at his wit's end, did he, Khrushchev, really want to help his enemy? Yes, he did. He repeated the word help to his foreign minister. Yes, help. We now have a common cause to save the world from those pushing us toward war. So how can we understand that moment? The two most heavily armed leaders in history, on the verge of total nuclear war, suddenly joined hands against those on both sides pressuring them to attack. Khrushchev ordered the immediate withdrawal of his missiles in return for Kennedy's public pledge never to invade Cuba, and his secret promise to withdraw U.S. missiles from Turkey, as he would in fact do. 
he couldn't do it publicly because he had to go through NATO and they couldn't do it fast enough to get the missiles out before nuclear war would occur. So he had to promise to Khrushchev, and Khrushchev had to accept the promise, and then Kennedy had to carry it out, all of which happened, and all of which happened in opposition to his Cold War advisors. The two Cold War enemies had turned, so they each now had more in common with his opponent than either had with his own generals. Neither John Kennedy nor Nikita Khrushchev was a saint. Each was deeply complicit in policies that brought humankind to the brink of nuclear war. Yet when they encountered the void, and that's especially what Thomas Merton means by the unspeakable, it's a void. It's a void of compassion. It's a void of responsibility. It's a void of humanity. And you don't get a bigger void than you do when you're about to fall into the heart of nuclear war. But in doing so, when they turned to each other for help, they turned humanity toward the hope of a peaceful planet. The genesis of the Kennedy Khrushchev turnaround and missile crisis was their secret correspondence that began over a year earlier. After their failed meeting in Vienna, under the pressure of the whole world watching, the following fall, Khrushchev, at Kennedy's suggestion, in a kind of a side in their, the enemy, he wrote his first secret letter to the president. It was wrapped up in a newspaper and was smuggled to Kennedy's press secretary, Pierre Salinger, by a Soviet agent posing as a magazine editor, a man whom Khrushchev trusted to maintain silence. In that groundbreaking letter, the communist leader emphasized his common ground with the president by a biblical analogy. This is the communists using this analogy. Khrushchev liked, he said, the comparison of their situation with Noah's Ark, which, as you know, is the title of the play phenomenon. Their situation was like Noah's Ark, and Khrushchev said, because both the clean and the unclean found sanctuary on Noah's Ark. And he went on, but regardless of who lists himself with the clean and who is considered to be unclean, Mr. President, they're all equally interested in one thing, and that is that the ark should successfully continue its cruise. And we have no other alternative. Either we should live in peace and cooperation so that the ark maintains its buoyancy, or else it sinks. In Kennedy's first secret letter in reply, he said, I like very much your analogy of Noah's ark with both the clean and the unclean determined that it stay afloat. And so through their secret correspondence, the two men struggled to achieve a better understanding of each other and their differences. The Cuban Missile Crisis a year later was proof that they had not resolved their conflicts. Yet it was thanks especially to the secret letters that each knew the other as a human being he could respect. They also knew that they had once agreed warmly that the world was a Noah's Ark. They had to keep the ark afloat, and they did at its most perilous moment. Once Kennedy and Khrushchev turned together toward peace and the missile crisis, they kept walking in that direction. The partial nuclear test ban treaty was a confirming sign of their joint decision to end the Cold War. Another sign was Nikita Khrushchev's counsel to Fidel Castro that he should work with John Kennedy. Castro was furious with Khrushchev when the Soviet leader withdrew his missiles at the 11th hour of the crisis without consulting the Cuban premier. The Russian had withdrawn Cuba's nuclear deterrent to U.S. aggression in returning for nothing but a, a promise by a capitalist. Castro thought Khrushchev, by negotiating peace with Kennedy, had betrayed the revolution. Khrushchev then wrote a peaceful, reconciling letter to Castro that corresponded to his Noah's Ark letter to Kennedy. He invited Castro to come visit him in the Soviet Union, and Fidel Castro accepted. 
He made that visit to Nikita Khrushchev in May, June 1963. So then the two of them rode in a train around the Soviet Union. And Castro said later that Khrushchev gave him a tutorial on their need to trust John Kennedy. Day after day, in this train, Khrushchev read aloud to Castro his correspondence with Kennedy, emphasizing the hope for peace they now had, he and Fidel, in working with the U.S. President. Nikita Khrushchev's son, Sergei, who is now a U.S. citizen, has described this remarkable process of education, this way he put it in his great big book about his father, in which he cites his father's descriptions of these events. He says, Father tried to persuade Castro that the U.S. president would keep his word and that Cuba was guaranteed six years of peaceful development, which was how long Father thought Kennedy would be in the White House. Six years, almost an eternity. In September 1963, President Kennedy initiated a secret dialogue with Fidel Castro to a U.S.-U.N. diplomat, Liam Atwood, to normalize U.S.-Cuban relations. Castro responded with enthusiasm and began to make secret arrangements for a meeting with Atwood. Kennedy jump-started the process by using a back channel to communicate with Castro. His unofficial representative, French reporter Jean Daniel, was actually meeting with Castro on the afternoon of November 22, 1963, when they heard the news of the president's death. Castro stood up, looked at Daniel, and he said, everything has changed. Everything is going to change. The U.S.-Cuban dialogue died in Dallas. And on October 11, 1963, JFK signed another national security memorandum, Number 263, it ordered a U.S. troop withdrawal from Vietnam, bringing home 1,000 U.S. military personnel by the end of 1963. By the end of 1965, the bulk of U.S. personnel and ordered that President Johnson quietly avoid it. The Vietnam War was reignited in Dallas. President Kennedy's greatest turn from global war to a strategy of peace provides the why, the why of his assassination. Given the Cold War dogmas of his government and his own turn toward peace, JFK's murder followed as a matter of course. It was a transparent act of state. On Friday morning, November 22, 1963, while John and Jacqueline Kennedy were in Fort Worth, Texas, preparing for their flight to Dallas, JFK read a threatening full-page advertisement addressed to him in the Dallas Morning News. Under a bold headline, Welcome, Mr. Kennedy, the ad was ordered in black, like a funeral notice. And it stated, because of your policy, thousands of Cubans have been imprisoned, are starving and being persecuted, with thousands already murdered and thousands more awaiting execution. And in addition, the entire population of almost 7 million Cubans are living in slavery. Hatred, in response to his decisions in the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis, was staring up at him. Then the ad went on to ask Kennedy, Why? Have you approved the sale of wheat and corn to our enemies when you know the communist soldiers travel on their stomachs just as ours do? Communist soldiers are daily wounding and or killing American soldiers in South Vietnam. JFK's wheat sale to the Soviet Union had come back to haunt him. Just as Thomas Burton had prophesied, Kennedy, by breaking through to compassionate decisions for all of humanity, had been marked out for assassination. That same afternoon, President Kennedy's 
body would be on its way to the funeral being announced to it by the ad in the Dallas Morning News. But thanks to those same decisions he made for all of us, by turning to his enemies rather than engaging them in nuclear war, the human family would still be alive. We would still have the chance to become the peacemakers we are all meant to be. Thomas Merton had prayed and written and struggled with hope for a spiritual awakening in us all to avert a final war. Were that miracle to occur, a peacemaking president would be able to ride away. But that changing of the sea was not allowed to happen. What Chief CIA propagandist Frank Wisner had called the mighty whirlwind kept on pumping out mighty lies about the past to keep the Cold War going and the people under control. As George Orwell observed about thought control forces, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. The president had the insightful courage to resist the mighty world music and his general's outright threats. He turned instead toward peace, a turning toward the hope of a disarmed world. As Merton prophesied, as a graceful moral imperative, but seems not to have expected, Kennedy both broke through to a compassionate humanity by America, who was therefore marked out for assassination. The president changed, but the sea around him did not change enough. There was no wave high enough for him to ride, and the sea was full of sharks. As Gandhi taught, there is the same inviolable connection between the means and the end as there is between the seed and the tree. Kennedy and Khrushchev learned to practice the means of peacemaking toward each other. Mutual respect, genuine dialogue, and seeing truth in a radically new perspective. That growing seed in their communications, as early as their their secret letters was already the process of general and complete disarmament that was envisioned by Kennedy in his United Nations speech, his American University address, and his National Security Action Memorandum 239. The means is the end in the process of becoming. In the year after the missile crisis, the seed of a disarmed world was growing rapidly in the trust between Kennedy and Khrushchev. It was even sprouting in Castro. As Khrushchev exulted over his future, he had six years left for peacemaking with Kennedy in the White House, almost an eternity. Gandhi understood that peacemaking is contagious, and JFK got the bug of peacemaking, the bug of hope. He got that hopeful bug from the Quakers, pressing to live up to his words on peace. Their sharp criticism provoked his ironic comment, you believe in redemption, don't you? Which doubled back on himself. JFK carried out a series of initiatives for peace as recommended by the Quakers. JFK got the contagious bug of peacemaking from his enemy, Khrushchev, who inspired him to live out their shared vision of keeping the ark afloat, however much it might cost both of them. <clears throat> and JFK was about to get the bug of peacemaking back from his other enemy, Fidel Castro, who got it from both Khrushchev and Kennedy. What might it be like if we too were so infected by that nonviolent bug of hope? So much so that we would be willing to live die for a love 
satisfies the Mohammed's Gandhi's heart have given us a hopeful way of understanding that story. Merton saw the need for a miracle to keep a total nuclear war from happening. Cold War propaganda had demonized the enemy and anesthetized, I can't pronounce that, anesthetized the people. The government was moving headlong toward a first strike strategy. Eisenhower's worst anticipations about the impact of the military industrial complex had come true. Religious leaders were silent, Merton's own monastic superiors were silencing him. The president was well meaning, Merton felt, but lacking in his deeper compassion and humanity that was sorely needed. In short, there seemed to be no hope in any direction for humanity and the earth to be saved. The miracle that Merton thought was necessary to save us all, humanity's complete change of heart and totally new outlook on the world, didn't happen. But another miracle did. The two ideological enemies in charge of the armies of the night, John Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev, were enlightened by nuclear terror and their need for each other's help. They turned to each other. They wrote 21 secret letters, they began to learn mutual trust, and they were converted to peacemaking as they and the rest of us were about to fall into the abyss. That was enough of a miracle for anyone and everyone. But the unspeakable surge over their new hope for peace killed one leader and overthrew the other and covered up their transforming story. To this day, it's an almost totally unknown story. The mighty Wurlitzer sure has seen to that. Its propaganda has found out the why of JFK's assassination, namely the Kennedy Khrushchev turn toward peace. It has therefore blasted away as well why that story matters. We, our children, and our children's children are why it matters. The JFK story is our passport to the future. Control demands despair and passivity. The masters of the deceit know that the Kennedy story, if widely known, would transform this world with their revolutionary understanding and hope. Maybe that's where you and I come in. If we know the story, what are we doing? Thomas Merton was right. We did need a miracle. The one that occurred was a fulfillment of Jesus' law of reality, which says we must love our enemies or be destroyed. Gandhi added to that law his Satyagraha insights that real love means seeing and absorbing the truth of the adversary. It means our willingness to be transformed by our enemy. Kennedy and Khrushchev profoundly fulfilled that law of reality. Humanity lived, but has survived without knowing why. How can we deepen our understanding of the why? How can we share that understanding? The transforming why of the Kennedy story is a key to our continuing survival through the climate crisis. Nonviolent change and depth we fear is impossible did in fact happen. If it hadn't, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be alive and struggling for the wider transformation that we're prayed for. I believe that incredible miracle will happen too, but we need to recognize and share the good news of the one that came to pass, which is our hope and strength for the one to come.
attacking each other means somebody can hold the extremists uh, back. Anyway, uh, we have a question from Judge Kirsten. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Price 
Crisis. <clears throat> and Fortune magazine the following month printed an editorial, almost certainly written by Henry Luce, the most powerful media man in the world, and very heavily into all of this process, which called Kennedy's position the eyes of April. Now think a minute about what that's saying just by the title. You've got Julius Caesar heading toward his assassination and William Shakespeare's work on that. And the the, the P phrase is the eyes of March. So we got Henry Luce talking about the eyes of April because of what Kennedy did in the steel crisis. And he enlarges on that in the editorial. Now, I do understand all of that stuff. I didn't understand well enough what you're talking about, and I still don't. To be clear, yeah, you go ahead and say something about it. But it, yeah, I've never found, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, it, um, give you a little bit of background briefly. The, uh, the Federal Reserve, although it's called the Federal Reserve, is a group of private. Yeah, I know, I know, I know that. Yeah, pretty much that background. In his attempt to straighten things out for the yeah. better term, um, that probably ruffled some feathers of the oh, I'm sure. world sort of crowd, so that, that yeah. that's all. Yeah, thank you very much. But there is, in each of these dimensions, there is somebody in this uh, umbrella of power who's being alienated. And when people ask, you know, who made the key decision on, you know, to assassinate the president, for which we have all kinds of evidence of the methodology and so forth. My basic uh, answer is it was a consensus decision. And that's really overwhelming when you understand the implications of that. But I think that's the nature of the process. This man, we cannot tolerate him anymore. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, could you tie this a bit with Martin Luther King and the experience you had at the trial, the one and only trial, the investigation of the yeah. murder? Well, that one, thank you for asking that. Um, <clears throat> I didn't get into this question through John F. Kennedy and it was through Martin Luther King because I was teaching when he was assassinated uh, April 4, 68, and we had a class, University of Hawaii, and the students to his martyrdom, uh, burn their draft cards. Um, they formed a Hawaii resistance. They went to jail for six months, two years. They took it seriously. They asked me, but I joined their group. Put up the shut up, Mr. Professor, not by you know. So, um, Martin Luther King, yeah, I did join the Hawaii resistance. Watching a troop convoy. That's the beginning of the end of my academic career. So, Martin Luther King is my baptism into nonviolence as a way of life rather than as something in a university classroom. So, I did go to the only trial I ever held for the assassination of Martin Luther King. It took place <coughs> November 15th to December 8th, 1999, in Memphis, just a few blocks from his, the site of his assassination at the Lane Motel. 70 witnesses testified. It was a wrongful death lawsuit initiated by Fred Scott King and the rest of his family. The jury, six black, six white people, a magnificent jury. I was there every day of the trial, watched them the whole time. They came back with, yes, there was a conspiracy to assassinate Martin Luther King. It included government agencies, that is, specifically in their verdict. So, next day, headlines all across the U.S. I was with a, I was sitting next to a woman for a couple of days. She was only able to be there for a few days. She was a, a reporter for the Portuguese newspaper um, in Lisbon. And she said to me as we were walking out of the courtroom, she said, look, everybody in the U.S. talks about the trial of the century. They talk about the Simpson trial of the century, O.J. Simpson, or they talk about Clinton's impeachment as the trial of the century. She said, this is the trial of the century, and who's here? Me, a reporter from Portugal, and you, a writer of books. What is going on here? What is going on? Second question. 
question, but uh, recently this year there was a release of a DVD, a documentary about the life of William Colby, CIA director. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen it or not. I have not. I know something about Colby. Yeah, but I was just a lot of press coverage in the days when like, he was still in office at the last days of the and he had it before Congress. And he was a Catholic, as you may know, and he had, according to this uh, documentary, some crisis in conscience. Yeah. And he felt that he had to, you know, he had friends who were Catholic priests, Jesuits, and he had spoken with them on occasion. And uh, you know, what is the right thing to do? What is the, you know, a just, a just war? And that's what he believed in: is the just war philosophy. And then he realized with Vietnam, things had gone far beyond that context. So when he found himself in the CIA, he, uh, in front of the con- uh, congressional hearing, he was asked. Point blank, but when the Congressman had the uh, U.S. intelligence establishment ever ordered the, uh, the assassination of uh, U.S. citizens, and he, he said yes, and they asked how many, and he said 62, but he would not disclose who those people were. And I just wanted to refer that to you, an event that you weren't aware of, it, and, the, and, the, and other members of the audience, and you can, you know. A video that we read in some places, so it's worth watching because I think there's a, a, a tie into the thesis that you're presenting here. And, uh, and I hope you have Colby, I think you make a hopeful tie in because uh, William Colby, um, like us all, was not uh, uh, a paragon of virtue. He was behind the Phoenix program, he was the primary art. Uh, Commander of the Phoenix program, um, which resulted in the assassination of tens of thousands of Vietnamese people. We're talking about 62 U.S. citizens, yes, and, six, and, and, and a huge number of Vietnamese. Uh, but I think if you read uh, the story of William Cole's death, almost certainly he would have been number 63 if you're going from the number he's counting to 63, because he had become a liability. You know, you brought to our attention. He was definitely having questions, and he was in a position where he was going to be asking things in a, a suit with regard to a, a death through so called LSD um, process in the 1950s, in which Colby knew the whole story, and that may have been one of the factors why for his, his death. That's, that's, that, that's a huge story in itself. The way in which uh, the Central Intelligence Agency was involved in using LSD throughout the 50s and the 60s. The, the kind of unspeakable things that were going on in those years and which have profoundly influenced all the decisions since then need to be understood and dealt with. So even if you just concentrated on one man, you're talking about Colby. I haven't seen the documentary, but I'm guessing from what you've said that it doesn't tell enough of the story. It doesn't tell the story of his death. And the story of his death is the sort of the revelation of the whole process that even the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, he gets it too. Colby was head of the CIA when he begins to have some questions of conscience. And may I say, um, you know, I, 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 I believe that the CIA was the coordinating agency for the, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. But my whole family is CIA. And so is yours, by the way. But, but I might in a very literal sense. Uh, my wife, Shelley, has four CIA parents. Father, mother, when they divorced, they married in the company, stepfather, stepmother. All of those parents are now no longer with us. Uh, they are very much a part of our family. Um, I'll tell you, tell you one story. Um, we were talking this evening about Frank Wisner, the mighty Wurlitzer. Well, one day, uh, my mother-in-law, Shelley's stepmother, and I were driving over what we call the mountain in Birmingham, Alabama. It's a small hill, actually. But in Birmingham, hills are mountains. So 
Shelly was asking me about uh, uh, my research, and I was researching Frank Wisner at that time. And uh, Nixie, my mother in law, was in the back seat, so at a certain point I remember going to Nixie because she worked at the CIA all her life. Uh, so I, I said, Nixie, uh, yeah, did, you run, did you run into Frank Wisner at all? And then in Frank Wisner during your time in the CIA, and she said, Well, I was his secretary. <laughs> All families, Archie, <laughs> used to say, uh, eat it. It's all in the family. I went to, to uh, University of Santa Clara, Santa Clara University, for four years. A good friend was a man named Leon Panetta. All in the family. I sent him a book, by the way, with an inscription. And at our, 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 at Yes. Yeah. Yes. Several points there. Nineteen November first, nineteen sixty-three. The Amish overthrowing the Amish was killed. The Kennedy and the movement towards peace was Kennedy involved with the decision to kill him. And the second point would be: was the CIA behind 9/11? <laughs> well, those are two very big questions. Um, the Amish and Kennedy. Uh, well, Kennedy had been one of the supporters of CM in his years in the Senate. He had been somewhat not, he wasn't a major factor, but he was certainly supportive of the process of getting CM in power. There are a lot of turning things that are going on in Kennedy's life. One of the worst things he felt that he did, because he, uh, the way he expressed himself on it, is that in the, the late summer of 1963, when he was in Hyannisport, his uh, national security advisors pushed through a resolution which in effect uh, meant that there was a process moving along that would overthrow CM. Kennedy was in Hyannisport and it was pushed through very, very fast. And he was extremely angry at the whole process, but he signed it. So he has to take responsibility for it. And from that point on, he was trying to stop the process, which was already moving along. And he had a man in, in Saigon, in Henry Cabot Lodge, whom he had appointed, and who was Attorney General Robert Kennedy, kept saying, see, I told you, don't let him in there. And Henry Cabot Lodge was doing everything he could to oppose Kennedy's wish to withdraw from Vietnam which he could have done with CM, CM the previous spring. This is all in a lot more detail than I can talk about tonight in a couple of chapters in the, in the book. But CM was wanting to pull out of the process with the United States. There were a lot of things that the CM did that were repressive, but he was getting, he was fed up with the United States. But there was, his regime um, was undermined by a CIA bomb in the so-called Buddhist crisis the previous spring. So the CIA moved forward a process which made it impossible for Kennedy and CM to get to a peace agreement in the previous spring, and then Kennedy's other national security advisors pushed through this initiative that began the process of overthrowing CM. From that point on, Kennedy wanted to, number one, stop that if he could, or at least slow it down, and at least save CM's life. And he sent one of his closest friends secretly to Vietnam to get CM to take refuge in the U.S. Embassy. And CM would not do it. So it's a very complicated process in which Kennedy was again being undermined by people around him. And when uh, it got to the point where there was an overthrow of CM um, and he did not take refuge in the U.S. Embassy and he was assassinated. And there are several descriptions of what happened when Kennedy got that news and he, he stood up and he was appalled and he rushed out of the room and he knew he was responsible in the sense that 
he had made a very bad decision and he'd never been able to turn it around. But we also have to understand that it was being made in Washington and he couldn't understand it well enough to really understand its implications when it happened. Kennedy is all alone, except for his brother. Yes. Yes. I think the most critical thing is... Oh, I didn't answer the second part of the question. But, <laughs> but I, you, you'll you make sure raise it. 9-11. Go ahead. Um, the fact that the media is in complete lockstep on the meaning of the assassination and making it a, what Vince Salandria calls a false mystery. There's no mystery there. And that it continues to this day, a half century later, shows beyond any shadow of a doubt who really was the architect of the coup in Dallas. Because if it was the mafia or some low-level Cubans, there would not be this cult of silence in the media about what happened. And that cult of silence is just as prevalent in most, I don't know if it's the case so much north of the border, but south of the border, even the so-called left alternative media will not touch this responsibly. That's true. And as for the CIA on September 11, a couple of dots. Uh, there's the insider trading on the airlines, where the company that was one of the main companies doing the insider trading on the United and American just before him, the former number three at CIA was the Mr. Buzzy Crumbar, uh, um, <coughs> was one of the main perpetrators of this. You also had the CIA conducting a plane into the building exercise. This was an Associated Press uh, a year after. To paralyze the air defense, there was an air defense exercise next to Dulles Airport that day. Um, and last year, the anniversary, there was a New York Times front page story that said the CIA counterterrorism staff just before 9 11 wanted to quit en masse because they knew the attacks were about to happen. They knew they could not be allowed to stop them, even though some of them were actually trying to stop it. And they wanted to quit so they wouldn't be there when it happened. And they were convinced not to quit because otherwise there would not be enough time to train their staff for the replacement. And finally, the CIA is probably behind a lot of the disinformation claims, positing all sorts of bizarre science fiction stories about what actually happened, which is the exact same scenario that they did with JFK assassination. Cover their tracks. Do you have any comment? Well, um, you know, uh, I'm no expert on all of these things, but I'm not, not an expert on anything. Uh, but when it comes to 9 to 11, uh, all I, 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 refer, I refer a lot to David Ray Griffin. Um, I like his work on it, but the main thing I refer anybody to is uh, watch the buildings come down. Watch the buildings come down, and then think about it. All you got to do is Google uh, architects and engineers from 9 Truth, and you'll see the buildings fall down. How do they get down like that? Just look at it, that's all. And, then, and think, think about it. Think about it. I thought that too at the start, but the firefighters who were there actually watched the buildings starting to buckle and lean before they came down and measured it. And to me, looking at this really intensely from day one, the strongest evidence is, just like with the Kennedy assassination, who had the ability to thwart the normal process of government to stop this type of thing from happening? Who suppressed all the allies? And the government agencies trying to stop this. And that alone is enough to get a conviction. I have a big voice. Uh, the question I would like to ask has to do with the phrase the unspeakable, you know, Thomas Merton.
Doug, and uh, I uh, really love your work. And, uh, anyway, uh, uh, one of the other things that uh, uh, other dimensions of the CIA that I think is uh, uh, blowing me away is the uh, uh, way I understand the transportation of large amounts of drugs, uh, uh, cocaine and heroin by uh, Air America, which is the CIA. Airports. That's just another dimension of uh, something just absolutely unspeakable. And, uh, I've done a lot of work on the downtown east side, and uh, uh, the implication of, uh, of that, the uh, Contra, what was it, the uh, Contra uh, uh, weapons, the illegal weapon sales, uh, all in work. Uh, it just uh, mind boggling. And then we go out to a 
uh, Lake Reservoir, and he drank beer, and I drank Coca-Cola, um, and uh, which is actually worse in terms of the corporate structure behind it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the uh, we had a lot of good times, uh, and he, you know, I've got a couple. Uh, his, his onion raids and the unspeakable. He has these wonderful ink etchings throughout the book, and uh, if you just well, you know, you're sitting around with him and you say, hey, here, you take these, I don't want them. So I've got these two things hanging in my uh, living room now. And he didn't like one of them because it looked too much like a fish. I love it. <laughs> you know. So he was just a very... Um, he was present. He was present. Whatever needed to be done, got done, but he was present and very sensitive to all kinds of things that were just sort of on the edge of your life. Like I, you know, you have conflicts of the personal nature something, for example. And he's not going to miss it, and um, uh, well, I loved him. And I learned a lot more from him after he was dead, because I kept going into it, and um, Begin to appreciate a little bit more what he what he was really up to. You know. So, like the stuff on the unspeakable, I I use that book for my classes, but I you know I'm still trying to catch up. What does he mean here? What does he mean there? And um, and it, that description, for example, that I read of his and that assessment of Kennedy's character, he tossed that off like in about. Uh, you know, a minute's time, banging away to type that. It is profound in its insights and in its prophetic character. And it's, I mean, the, the whole, you know, I've got 500 pages trying to understand that one statement and its implications that if he breaks through into that, then this is, you know, that's Merton. He did that for many people on many different subjects. Yeah. I can, uh, I've been spending years trying to, uh, to find who the unspeakable are, so straight up between that here, I can test the thesis against you, um, particularly in regards to President Kennedy's assassination. I, I actually teach a course on the Kennedy, Kennedy assassinations on Bobby's anniversary at you know, the U.S. Minister School Board. Yeah. Um, I feel that the very top, the top number one problem in the world is the international bankers, uh, like the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, so they work through countries like the United States, so I feel it's not about it's not about the American government, it's beyond the American government. In a sense, the American government is a victim of the process. And with President Kennedy, John J. McCoy, was a representative of the Federal Reserve Banking System. He was the president of the Chase Manhattan Bank, representative of the Rockefellers. Yeah. So he was on the Warren Commission, president of the meeting on November 21st at Dallas, and the Dallas night for the assassination of Clinton Burks and Mansion. So it shows his involvement. So in that meeting, there was also Vice President Johnson, uh, Jed Cooper. Um, so it shows the banking interest. So I feel like it goes beyond uh, the United States. So uh, well, it's called the New World Order. It's perhaps the most common term referring to the, the cabal of bankers and others. But isn't that perhaps the, the top of the problem? The CIA and the are also orchestrating control and working for the New World Order that the control goes beyond the United States. Uh, I, I agree with your analysis. I don't have proof, but it's obvious. <laughs> uh, it's obvious in the sense of the way power works, but uh, I don't put things in books that I don't can't prove, so I don't put all that kind of... I mean, I have all kinds of thoughts about Kennedy's assassination that I don't didn't put in that book, but, I, but I've got an end note for everything that I put there. Everything. Everything. And they aren't anonymous. I mean, I don't have anonymous sources. They're, it's all there, and uh, I'm going to stick to that. So, uh, if you if you read the story, it it, it 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 goes to all of those dimensions. But we've got to get there by evidence in order to keep the story going. But I agree with you. Yes. Last night we watched uh, Susan Rice on television. Very, yes. Very pleased with uh, the UN sanctions against North Korea. Uh, I just couldn't help but think that they either haven't read your book or they certainly didn't understand the 
as the basis for peace in the world, the first person to receive that letter for peace about uh, a week and a half, two weeks before it was issued publicly, was who? The Kiddushin. In Russian translation, delivered to him personally by Norman Cousins, and Khrushchev had given this thing that he, he was, you know, he was electrified, and, and Cousins explained to him what was the nature of the document and so forth. And then he gave to Khrushchev a papal medal, a personal gift from Pope John XXIII, to Khrushchev for the dawn. And when Cousins went on his way, Khrushchev went into the next room where there were the, you know, his chief advisors and commissars and so forth, and he had his paper metal on. And so he's going like this, nobody said anything, so he took it off and dropped it on the floor. And somebody finally said, well, what's that? And so I saw this one from the Pope. <laughs> and um, when Norman Cousins, when he came back again, and Khrushchev told him this story, it was a pain in his eye. Cousins went back and told Kennedy, and Kennedy, with a smile, said, you know, there are some things that the chairman can be proud of that I can't be proud of. The Catholic president, doesn't brag about his relationship with the Pope. The Soviet head of state does. But anyhow, this was a conspiracy. You know what a conspiracy is? You breathe together. It was a kind of an odd breathing together. And Norman Cousins wrote a book about it that is very little read. It's called The Improbable Triumvirate. The Improbable Triumvirate is John F. Kennedy. John the 23rd and Nikita Khrushchev and they're conspiring for peace and the Cousins knows every step of the process because he was taking the messages from one to the other. This is the hidden history of the 60s. This is the reason for this, that kind of thing. Why was, were, were there, there were remarkable steps for peace going on and why Kennedy had to be taken out from the standpoint of the powers to be. And we have to understand it. And also have to understand that it's not a story of this, it's a story of this, because had he not made the decisions that he did, we wouldn't be talking about it. So that's, that's a, an element of hope right there, you know. And if you're willing to take the bullet, as he was, you can do some good things in this world, and he did it. As the Quaker said, you got to do this, Mr. President, he said, you know, as they're besieging him with things, this, that, and the other things, he said, people give him attention, don't you? And one of the reasons why the left, in particular, dismisses John F. Kennedy as a cold warrior, as happens, in all kinds of prominent people, is I don't think that it's that easy for people who understand really well what needs to be done, that it could possibly have been done by a rich, philandering, <coughs> Catholic, no good cold warrior of a president, but who asked us, you believe in redemption, don't you? Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, I've been told that uh, uh, Jack Cantor, Thomas Merton, had correspondence with Ethel Kennedy, a lengthy correspondence. Was that before Jack Kennedy died? That yes. That there was. Yes. Uh, let's go back a little bit farther. Her mother, Ethel Kennedy's mother, was Thomas Merton's secretary. And Skakel, and Skakel in the 1950s, typed Merton's manuscripts. He sent them up to their home. She offered to do it. Um, she was, she and her husband were sponsors for the monastery, and they helped them out. And um, and she and her staff of secretaries. She was a, she was a trained typist. She, that was her, her background, her business background. She typed and then members of the staff did. So then uh, Ethel uh, goes to school.
school, and at the school she attended, um, I'm forgetting which one it was now, a guy named Dan Walsh was her philosophy <coughs> professor, and Dan Walsh was Thomas Merton's way into the Abbey of Gethsemane. He asked him first, you know, Walsh and Merton were very good friends at Columbia University. Walsh was a professor there. And he was involved in Merton's conversion and his first line of defense and then winding up the Abbey of Gethsemane. So when Ethel Scapel, who will become Ethel Kennedy, went to school, her philosophy professor was Dan Walsh at, at her school, and they became very good friends. And so she was, he was there, uh, he was her and Robert Kennedy's confidant as they prepared for their marriage. And the first child of Robert and Ethel's marriage had as, as her godfather, Dan Walsh, who's Merton's close friend. We've got all these kinds of ties between the Kennedy family and Merton. This is the um, <coughs> Ethel and Robert Kennedy. Um, and so there were, there were messages, informal messages, that went back and forward, too. Thomas Merton was asked to come to the White House and give talks by Robert Kennedy. In a message that went between uh, the Robert Kennedy family to Dan Walsh to Merton. And Merton was tempted at any time. My God, I'm talking about going to the White House. I mean, this is this guy who's supposed to be a contemporary in the months. So he, he didn't know. So anyway. But, but yes. And of course, they corresponded, and the, and the correspondence is in, uh, in Merton's uh, letters, and we can read those letters. And, and Merton sent some of his most important manuscripts, you know, during the years when he was allowed to publish them, uh, to Ethel Kennedy, always with a remark about, you know, you might want to pass this on to the president and stuff like that. Nature. That business about the unspeakable and the void is something I've thought about over the years. And uh, just to add a footnote, perhaps, to the notion that Merton has, uh, Merton said, it might look to you as if the void is a moral vacuum, as if it's a sort of inert space. But he said, if you take away from human beings their capacity to respond to human beings, you end up not with an inert space, but with a violent one in which the capacities that human beings have for life and love and so on are frustrated. And so the void becomes a turmoil within individuals and within the culture at large, unable to identify what's bothering it. But Merton says, this is what it is. We don't simply live in moral vacuums. Something fills those spaces. And it's not something pretty. Anyway, I want to thank James very much for really extraordinary service tonight, especially the generosity of the extra period of questions and so on. It, it makes me think of, in the book, Raids on the Unspeakable, there's an essay in which Merton refers to an innocent bystander. And at the end of the book, he says, there are certain people in society who are like the child in the story about the emperor's new clothes. And he says, this person is the only reason why the rest of us are not criminal. This child, uh, and the child for Merton is simply a symbol of the unusual, of that which is ordinarily excluded from social discourse but which the child sees and brings to our attention. To some extent, that's how I feel tonight. You have a very excellent presentation. Thank you very much.